So it is my pleasure to welcome to the first of this new season of talks, uh, John Salvatore, who is going to be talking to us about all things Roman in Exeter. And I shall at this point hand straight over to John, who will introduce himself and tell you a little bit about himself uh, before launching into the talk. Uh, thanks for being here, John, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Mark. Um, okay, well, um... I don't know about all things Exeter, but uh, Roman Exeter, but I'm going to be talking primarily about Roman military Exeter, which is a relatively short period at the beginning of the life of Roman Exeter. And on the screen, you'll see there at the top, AD 43 to 55, is the period when, uh, sorry, it is the uh, period of the Roman invasion of Britain and pertinent to uh, us is that date of 55. But if you look at the screen, you'll see that um, there were these, these four arrows emanating out from the, from the southeast, uh, represent the advance of the uh, four legions of the invasion. But the legion we are primarily concerned with is the one that arrives at Exeter around AD 55. And that's the second legion Augusta, which is this one which campaigned down here through the uh, uh, south, southwest, um, eventually establish, establishing uh, a fortress base at what is now uh, the, the city of Exeter. Um, and I say uh, we know that it was the uh, Second Legion Augusta that uh, arrived at Exeter and constructed the fortress. And we know that because of the Roman histories, which tell us about the Emperor Vespasian. Before he became Emperor, uh, Vespasian was the commander of the Second Legion Augusta at the time of the inv invasion in 43. And because uh, people, when he became emperor, um, people were interested in, 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 in his life and what he'd been, been doing. And Roman historians took an interest and wrote about his campaigns. And his campaigns within the Second Legion Augusta were all uh, within the South, uh, south of Britain, uh, for example, uh, the Second Legion Augusta are thought to be the legion which stormed Maiden Castle, um, uh, the, 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 the large hill fort in, in, in Dorset, which I'm sure you've all heard about. He was uh, credited as well with capturing the Isle of Wight and eventually uh, the legion made its way across to Exeter by around 55. Unfor well, unfortunately, um, but for our purposes, uh, Vespasian is unlikely ever to have been in Exeter, <clears throat> despite what uh, one might find in a plaque in the Cathedral Close. And you can see that there to your right, uh, Vespasian uh, Caesar. Uh, there's a coin on there uh, to the left, uh, a, uh, a coin of, of, of Vespasian. Vespasian went back to Rome, we believe, in around 50-51. So that's uh, before the arrival of the Legion at Exeter. So there would have been uh, a different commander whose name uh, we, 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 don't, we don't know. Um, then that commander uh, didn't reach the heights of an emperor, so we'll, uh, we'll never know who that, uh, or unlikely ever to know who, who that is. So arriving at Exeter uh, from a previous base in Dorset, which we believe was Lake Farm, there may have been a Roman army presence as well at Dorchester following the uh, occupation of Maiden Castle. The Second Legion arriving at Exeter would have been around 6,000 legionaries, uh, Roman citizen legionaries. And when I say Roman citizens, I don't mean that they were from Rome. 
or even necessarily from Italy. Prior to the invasion, the Second Legion Augusta was stationed in Strasbourg in Gaul, and recruitment was probably in that area uh, for, for quite a long period of, of, of time. The officers, on the other hand, uh, would have been uh, the commander, um, the, 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 the camp prefect, tribunes. They would have been full, full Roman citizens, potentially from, uh, most likely from Rome itself. So arriving at Exeter, as I say, you've got about 6,000 legionaries, but not just that, uh, you have an equivalent number of non-Roman citizen auxiliaries, uh, these will be uh, those troops stationed out at the forts. Uh, we'll look at those in a minute, outside of Exeter, uh, across Devon and, and Cornwall. Um, they, were, they, they would have been recruited, um, but uh, non-Roman, as I say, non-Roman citizen. After 25 years in the auxiliaries, if they survived, then they were granted Roman citizenship. So you can say there's a sizable army, and not just a sizable army uh, of 12,000, perhaps in excess of 12,000 men, but also the camp followers and the tradesmen and merchants which, uh, which, which accompanied the army. We, we could be looking at around 20,000 um, coming in into the area at, at that stage, which is a sizable number, as you might appreciate. Um, there on the slide, <clears throat> you can see uh, the fortress of Exeter, the base of Second Legion Augusta, as I've said, and constructed on pottery and coin evidence around AD 55. And around Exeter in the hinterland and further to the uh, west, you can see a series of forts, may well have been constructed a somewhat later date, uh, some of them rather well known and have been subject to recent excavation. I'm thinking here of Oakhampton, uh, which was a fort which had quite a sizable civilian population living just outside of it. I, I mentioned that there would be a number of merchants, camp followers, uh, associated with all of these forts and indeed the fortress. Uh, for example, you will see uh, to the southeast of Exeter, the Exeter fortress, a site at St. Lois. This was a <clears throat> civilian trading settlement uh, which relied on trade with the uh, bringing in imports uh, from Gaul via almost certainly a port at Topsham. Uh, and trading with the, uh, the Legion, uh, bringing goods in for the Legion, and also for the forts, the outlying forts. They were all being connected by a road system. And now you can see here uh, the, uh, 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 the Exeter from the air on, on the left there, and the purple rectangle is the area of the Roman fortress, not to be confused with the Roman town, which is a, if my, yes, my cursor, I hope you might be able to see, the walled Roman town, uh, the walled Roman town, uh, about 200 acres, and within it, uh, the wooden, fortress uh, of about 40 acres. And on the right there is the reconstruction drawing of the fortress, which arrives to us after a number of excavations during the 1970s and 1980s, which enabled that uh, plan and that uh, reconstruction uh, to be drawn up, mainly the work <clears throat> of the late Chris Henderson, if anyone, uh, recalls him the director of the Exeter Archaeological Excavation Unit. 
Now, um, I was lucky enough to uh, arrive in Exeter uh, from London in around, well, it was 1972, and um, lucky enough to be involved in the major excavations which showed Exeter to have been the site of a Roman fortress. And these were the Roman military bathhouse, uh, which we'll come to, of course, and the uh, barrack blocks uh, of the Roman army, uh, the Roman legion, which were discovered beneath the redevelopment of the Guildhall shopping centre. Those were the two major excavations. And here we can see on the left, um, you may be able to make out uh, the areas of yellow and white, which are excavation areas, uh, including the one in the center there, which are yeah, pretty much in the center or just to, to the north of center uh, is the Roman bathhouse site. And to its left is the site of the Fabrica, I had the Roman uh, bronze working uh, uh, factory, which was discovered or part of it was discovered and the barracks of the cohort blocks of, uh, of the legion of which uh, there, there, there were 10 uh, of these cohort blocks and they were arranged and I'll try and use the cursor if it doesn't jump me to the next Next slide, you might be able to see the cursor here going around. These are the barrack blocks of the legion. The, the fortress is mostly accommodation for the 6,000 legionaries. In the center of the fortress was the bathhouse, uh, uh, the uh, fabrica, bronze working shop, some granaries. If I switch to the across here to the uh, reconstruction, um, you can see barrack blocks here. They actually say 12. Um, it's debatable. Uh, there may have been two extra sets of cohort blo uh, barrack blocks. We're, we're not sure. There was room for 12, um, but it was usual uh, 10. And right in the center, if I can get my cursor there, you'll see a P, the letter P, and this stands for the Principia, and this was the central administration block for the fortress. This is where the legionary eagle would have been held, uh, the pay chests, and, and where the principal decisions were made with regard to the, uh, the operation of the legion. And to one side of it, uh, uh, probably to the left-hand side was the um, commander's house. The main gate of the fortress was a uh, forward of the Principia. Um, I've lost there, uh, I've got it now. The cursor was forward of the Principia at the Porta Principalis, this is the main gate. And that overlooked the River X. And if you want to uh, go to that point today and, and, and stand where that main gate was overlooking the X, you would need to go down 4th Street and there, well, there was an arcade on the left hand side, which has now been redeveloped and that's approximately where the uh, main gate of the fortress was. So the excavations, although uh, limited in scope, uh, throughout the 70s and 80s, nevertheless, were enough, um, especially where we excavated on the defences, particularly at the corner here at Rack Street, were enough to enable us uh, to, uh, or enable Chris Henderson rather, to produce a plan of the fortress. And because uh, Roman forts and fortresses are, are built to a, a fairly standard pattern, it was possible then to predict uh, where these various buildings uh, would have been placed. The one that we are missing is the hospital, and that is almost certainly because it's under the modern day 
uh, oh, sorry, modern day, uh, 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 under the present cathedral. And before we reach the bathhouse, I just want to, um, the Roman bathhouse, which is one of the principal buildings which we're going to be talking about. Um, I just want to draw your attention to these models of the barrack blocks. As I've said, the majority of the fortress, or, or a sizable proportion, I should say, of the fortress <clears throat> was given over to accommodation. And the accommodation was in the form of barrack blocks. And for the legionaries anyway, the centurion would have had rather more luxurious room uh, to himself. But for the legionaries, the ordinary legionaries, you can see a cutaway here. It was a, a bunk bed system. It was also a hot bed system. Um, each of those uh, little rooms in theory held eight legionaries, but of course, uh, with um, uh, various details and fatigues and sentry duty, you wouldn't have, you would not have had eight men all in the room at the same time. They would have been switching over, switching duties, uh, so maybe four um, at any one time, and then the other four would be sleeping. The other four. On, on duty or outstation. You can see there, there's a cutaway as well of uh, a barrack uh, in theory under construction. All of the buildings with the exception of the uh, Roman military bathhouse, all of the buildings were of wood. You can see the construction there of the wood and uh, in, in wood of a barrack block and uh, finished off with rendered uh, wattle and door walls <clears throat> and uh, tiled roofs. The red tile, very much a, a, a Mediterranean style of, of roofing, which is um, imported uh, into, into this country. So we move on um, to just to explore now the Roman military bathhouse, which, as I say, was the um, the only building, the only building we found that was constructed in stone. I I cannot emphasize the uh, overemphasize really the significance of this building. It was constructed, we think, around AD sixty, uh, somewhere around there. It is, without question, the first stone building ever in the southwest of England. It's potentially only the second stone building in Britain at that stage. Uh, the first one being the Temple of Claudius at, um, at Colchester. This would, for the local uh, people, uh, in the area, the local tribes, the Dumnoni, uh, to see this building in its glory and at, at its height would have been akin to a moon landing. This is a spectacular building by any stretch of the imagination. What you are seeing there in that shot, which has been taken from uh, the cathedral, are the excavations underway in 1972. I've looked long and hard. Uh, I can't, I was there in 72. Um, I can't see myself there. I can see one or two people uh, in the excavation. You see the excavation is proceeding. Um, part of a room uh, has been uh, excavated, which is part of a hypercourse system. And we'll come on to that. Uh, but you see there's still plenty of excavation to be undertaken further towards the war memorial. <clears throat> On the other hand, excavation has already been completed in, uh, by that stage in, in 1971 at the site of the St. Mary Major Church. If any, uh, a, a, any of you were around in the 1970s in Exeter, you may have known that there was a significant large Victorian church just in front of the cathedral. 
uh, opposite the cathedral. It was decided to demolish that church and to put in an underground car park on, on the site. You'll see around uh, the excavation area uh, to the top of the picture, a number of cars. In the 1970s, it was possible to park not only around the War Memorial, but to within about, I would say, six yards of the front door of the, or the front door of the cathedral. Uh, the cathedral, quite rightly, didn't want this. They, they thought the solution was be, would be to get all the cars underground. And the excavations for the, uh, uh, for the underground car park commenced, but with an archaeological condition, so to speak, that if anything uh, was found, uh, that it would be recorded. Of course, they, they were expecting only to find wooden buildings and instead, instead found this uh, massive uh, stone structure which of course scotched any idea of um, of having the car park there. The uh, the remains had to be. They demanded to be uh, preserved uh, potentially for public display. We'll talk about that uh, again um, a, li a little later. Um, here you can see a plan of the cathedral. Um, in the context of the present day, uh, you can see there the cathedral to the right, uh, the high street out there uh, to, 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 the, uh, to, to the left. Uh, the War Memorial itself uh, is shown there. It, this is a lar very large building, extremely large building, uh, divided into uh, three, essentially. Uh, into three large rooms, a hot room, a uh, warm room and a cold room. And there would have been a, also uh, would have been changing rooms as well. Uh, there would, would have been an Olympic size uh, swinging pool uh, in a, in a, a palestra, uh, an exercise yard. Uh, we haven't found that, we don't know where that is, but that's probably uh, somewhere uh, below those buildings fronting on to um, South Street. This is an uh, astonishing building, as I say. Uh, this is a, a, a drawn uh, reconstruction, uh, again by, uh, by, by, by Chris Henderson. And there you can see those divisions of the, the uh, Frigidarium, cold room, the Tepidarium, the warm room, and the Caldarium, the hot room. And the idea was that you, you got changed uh, or some, somewhere in changing rooms to the left. Then you entered the cold room and you made your way through the warm room <clears throat> to the caldera and the hot room where you would uh, gradually be opening up the pores of the skin. You would spend uh, a lot of time then in the caldarium where the main bathing and cleaning took place. Uh, uh, the legionaries would use something called a strigil to scrape the skin. Uh, there were plunge baths there. And when, uh, you, as you can see, this for, for, for troops uh, stationed uh, in the area, uh, this was a major uh, rest and relaxation uh, uh, venue not just for the legionaries, but presumably the, the auxiliaries were allowed uh, to come into the fortress to make use of the facility uh, uh, as well. So a major investment in the morale for the troops stationed here, who had come, as I say, from uh, rather warmer climes in, uh, in France at Strasbourg. There's no evidence that the legionaries were called upon to fight in the southwest, although they could have been, we don't know. But certainly uh, they were involved in major uh, building schemes, roads, bridges, and indeed the bathhouse itself uh, was constructed by, by the legionaries. So here you're looking at the site under excavation. Um, the walls of the 
uh, Victorian Mary Major, St. Mary Major Church uh, in the top corner there, the top left-hand corner. And you're looking there at the base floor of the hypercourse system. The floor itself would have been suspended um, on those series of uh, 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 what are called pile tiles. The floor is gone um, uh, and was destroyed. And I'll explain the reason for that in a few minutes. So you're looking there at the, uh, the excavated base, in this case of the warm room, the calderium. And there were two furnaces either side of the room which, which fueled and fed the hot air which ran between all of those uh, uh, pili tiles heating the floor above. So it's essentially a sort, it's, it's like a type of sauna system, a below ground sauna system. I'll ex I expect you're, you're familiar with it. It's the Roman hypercourse uh, uh, heating and bathing system. Uh, here again, this is a rather clearer shot, <clears throat> rather uh, a, a rather marvelous uh, uh, cleaned uh, excavation shot of the, the base of the system there. And you can see at the far end, there's an apse. And within that apse would have been a basin with uh, cold water at, at floor level, uh, at, with cold water where one could splash oneself, uh, bathe, Oh, uh, if you wanted to 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 uh, uh, wash some of the dirt and the sweat that was being exuded um, after after a hard day's perhaps uh, working on the, a construction site of a road or a bridge or something of, of that kind. This is the uh, uh, same arrangement, uh, but in the surviving baths at Pompeii. There you can see an apse with the uh, the uh, the uh, pedestal, um, a bathing uh, stall, for want of a better word, uh, and that's what we were looking at. If you can look at the top there, where the range the red and white ranging pole is, that's the approximate position uh, where we're we're looking at in this view. And I explained that the air was channeled into the hot room. Um, and then it was channeled through into the, there, there were a, a number of small events which allowed that hot air or some of it to enter the uh, warm room, the tepidarium. And here you're seeing one of the vents between the rooms. Uh, you'll note, the uh, construction, the really fine ashlar construction. I mean, this is this is below ground, uh, but you, you would never have seen this. Uh, it was below the suspended floor. Probably that stone there represents one of the stones that was supporting the suspended floor at that level. So you wouldn't have actually seen any of this. Nevertheless, the stone has been told uh, uh, perfectly there to make this arch. And it's worth mentioning that the stone that we're looking at there is the volcanic uh, stone, very popular with the Romans and uh, quarried not very far away from Rougemont, the Red Hill, where the castle is. The air, that area later incorporated into the Roman city uh, with the Roman city walls also utilizing uh, the volcanic stone for construction. But at this stage, AD 60, uh, Rougemont is the quarries are outside the fortress. Uh, here again, a model, uh, which I think uh, is attempting to illustrate the, the grandeur of the building and the, the bathing facilities available, uh, no expense was spared. Uh, uh, you've got glass there, specially made glass. You have, um, you have perfect marble is, in, is brought in from Dorset uh, for the fittings. 
you can see there's a tessellated, the, the floor there is, is tessellated. Uh, we have evidence of, in fact, the earliest evidence in the country of polychrome colored mosaic, and you would have had, uh, you would have painted uh, murals, painted wall scenes, which are illustrated again in, in, in this model. Here's some examples of uh, those things I've just mentioned, which were found uh, in the top uh, top left there, the colored mosaic, uh, some uh, window glass to its right, uh, some um, at the bottom left, uh, some more of the tesserae, the mosaic. Uh, there in the middle, there's a part of a bowl of perfect marble. And to the right, just something that's rather interesting, one of those Pile tiles that supported the floor, you won't be able to see it clearly, I don't think, uh, but it has, it does have some uh, writing inscribed on it whilst it was still wet and was waiting out in, in the sunshine to be dry. Uh, somebody had a practice of uh, some Latin letters there. It's just alphabet. It's not, it's, it's not a word, but it's just a practice there. So somebody doing some homework um, on a, uh, uh, perhaps, perhaps somebody young um, doing some homework there. And when I say young, I should mention that the fortress was inhabited solely by legionaries who were unmarried. They weren't allowed to marry, uh, but they could have wives and partners outside of the fortress who weren't allowed into the fortress. The only exceptions to this were the uh, commanding officer, uh, the high officers and the tribunes were allowed uh, to be married and could have families with them inside the fortress. So it's just possible that one of the children of those uh, was practicing, um, as I said, the uh, alphabet. Um, I mentioned that the bathhouse was constructed in uh, around AD 60. Now something else was happening very significant for the Romans in AD 60, which you'll know about, and that was the, the Boudican Revolt. Um, the Boudican Revolt drew in uh, the other three legions uh, that were in Britain at the time, but we know from the histories the Roman histories, it did not draw in the Second Legion Augusta, which, as you know, we, we, we firmly believe is based in Exeter in AD 60, and indeed um, ha has been involved in the construction of that marvelous bathhouse um, that we've just been looking at. When um, Boudicca advanced and sacked uh, Colchester, and then uh, London, and then Verulamium, St. Albans. Uh, the other legions of, uh, uh, based in Britain, two of which were in, uh, in Wales at the time, uh, were called upon to march against Boudicca. Uh, you'll see the site there showing a battle point. We're not certain about that, but quite possibly somewhere in the Midlands. But the significant thing you'll, you'll note from, from this slide is that the second legion isn't mentioned at all. Um, you've got the 20th legion there, you've got the 14th, you've got the 9th, which is um, holed up perhaps um, somewhere, in, uh, somewhere in, in, in East Anglia. But the second and the 20th are, are brought back from Wales to tackle Boudicca and orders were sent to uh, the Second Legion of Augusta to join this battle. Uh, and they were those, uh, the Roman histories tell us that the orders were received by the camp prefect at, uh, um, at, uh, at Exeter, but he refused to go. He refused to send the Second Augusta. Uh, we think the commander himself um, and the second in command at the Second Augusta were uh, actually outstationed up possibly with a detachment of the legion up with the 14th and the 20th 
in Wales. And that's why it was the camp prefect that made the decision not to march the legion out from Exeter. Uh, and I'm just, uh, yes. And the, the reason may have been that he had received word about what had happened. Uh, this is hypothetical. He may have received what had, uh, news of what had happened at Colchester uh, and decided that it would be best to try to defend the, uh, uh, the, the, the areas of the fortress, including its newly constructed bathhouse um, and some of the other major infrastructure uh, in the Southwest, particularly perhaps the uh, port at Topsham, if the Southeast was under pressure and, and had lost the ability there uh, to, um, uh, for troops to arrive in the, in the uh, Southeast, he may have decided perhaps best to, uh, uh, to, to, to keep what we have or what they have um, at, uh, at Exeter in terms of a reserve and, and, and the ability to bring troops and reserves across from Gaul uh, through the port of Topsham. Um, anyway, he, um, he decided that was, uh, that was the thing to do. With hindsight, he was right. The Boudicca was defeated by the 14th and the 20th. They didn't need the Second Legion. Unfortunately, because he dis disobeyed uh, the order, uh, he uh, paid with his life and had to fall on his sword. But I just want to suggest what the Second Legion may have been doing instead of battling with uh, Boudicca. Uh, we know that uh, legionaries are involved in the construction of defences. and for This is Trajan's Column. And these are legionaries involved in construction work of, uh, of defences. There you can see, this is what happened at Colchester, obviously just an illustration to show you the Boudican attack on Colchester. And there you can see that's the, the Temple of Claudius, the other stone building um, in Britain at this time, the other one being um, our bathhouse at Exeter. And there it is being stormed, and those that took shelter in the Temple of Claudius being, being burned. Here again, you're seeing an illustration of legionaries uh, constructing defences, ditched defences and ramparts. And this is what I think uh, uh, our uh, legion was set to do. Uh, to improve the defences of the various sites uh, in and around Exeter so that they were strengthened, that they couldn't be, uh, that they couldn't be overrun, not necessarily by Boudicca, not necessarily, but possibly by uh, a local insurrection. And we don't know the relationship uh, uh, between the uh, Roman authorities, uh, the Roman army, and the tribes, the Iron Age tribes to the west, the Dumnoni and the other tribes to the west in Cornwall. If they hadn't been ro what's called Romanized to the extent that had happened in the uh, southeast, for example, those of you that have been to uh, Fishbourne would have seen the Roman style uh, Fishbourne Palace that was constructed there for the uh, local Iron Age uh, chieftain. There's none of that in the Southwest and it's quite possible that they were fearful. The Roman army here, the Second Legion Augusta and its camp, uh, and its, um, camp prefect were fearful that what had happened at Colchester could happen here. And I mentioned that there was a sizable civilian uh, population that relied on the army for protection, indeed. One site which was excavated um, around 2010, uh, uh, not yet published, but 
will be, in, I hope, in the not too distant future, was located on Topsham Road at the site of a, a new retirement um, uh, retirement uh, uh, village um, on the former St. Louis College. Uh, you can see there some of the buildings of on this excavation plan, some of the buildings there. But what's particularly significant, you can see that it's been at some stage, it's been protected by a double ditch, those black parallel lines representing a sizable uh, double ditch defense that's been put around that civilian settlement to protect it from something. You can see there the scale of those defenses, they're significant. I, I would suggest that rather than uh, sitting here uh, twiddling sums whilst um, Boudicca was being uh, defeated by the other two legions, the second Augusta was hard at work uh, constructing these type of defenses uh, to ensure that uh, the, the Roman infrastructure, the civilian population here were protected um, against the same kind of insurrection that had been successful in the territory of the Iceni. Here again, these are the, um, let's say, reconstruction drawing of the defenses of the legionary fortress. Uh, you can see here this massive ditch, which is a Punic ditch, a killing ditch. If anyone was foolish enough to attack the fortress and jumped on uh, across the ditch onto this uh, this area, tried to climb the rampart, they would be forced back into the bottom of the ditch and then face this impossible vertical wall, uh, whilst the, and exposing their back as well. With the Romans able to, the Roman legions able to throw some very nasty things. Um, into your back if you were foolish enough to try to attack. Um, uh, here we see, and this is a relatively uh, recent uh, slide that I've constructed and uh, not yet published, but it, it, it's, it's to demonstrate how significant the Exeter Fortress is and how significant this road which is the Topsham Road, of course, those of you that know it will know this is a, a straight road through to Topsham until, um, well, it's a straight through route, uh, route, modern day route through to Topsham, but in the Roman period, uh, in the Roman period, it was straight as far as approximately the M5, which if I can recover the cursor, here and then it deviated down into this area where it says site of suspected quayside. Military period buildings have been found all across this area and we now have, uh, uh, it's called on this side St. Louis Military Supply Base, uh, which is not really the correct term. It was a civilian site which did indeed supply uh, the Roman military, but it's it's um, a civilian site, not a military site. But nevertheless, it acquired military-style defences, and it's my belief that this entire area here would have been heavily defended at the time of the Boudican Revolt to ensure that they secured they secured uh, the. Um, uh, the, the, the port or barge port area <coughs> here, so that there was a communication back to the Roman Empire, back to Gaul, that wasn't threatened, um, as uh, was the case in the, the southeast and the, uh, the ports across the, 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 the channel there, which of course are quite, quite, quite a deal closer. Uh, one of the uh, the, in the aftermath of the Boudican Revolt, as I say, the, the camp prefect, with hindsight, was perfectly correct. They didn't need Legion II, although they were ordered to 
to, to attend the battle. They weren't, they weren't needed ultimately. Boudicca was defeated. But Legion II, um, that be, be, because it didn't uh, appear, did not acquire the battle honors, uh, which was unfortunate. You can see here, these are the legionary flags of uh, two of the legions involved. There, Legion 20 and Legion 14 were the two that, that um, defeated Boudicca, and they were awarded battle honors. Uh, in the case of 20, Valeria Victrix, and in the case of the 14th, Martia Victrix, battle honors. And if you look at the banner of Legion 2, Augusta, there is nothing. Um, this is one of the reasons why the uh, camp prefect was. Uh, not called upon, but bec be because he dis disobeyed the order, uh, Legion 20, uh, uh, Le uh, Legion 2 Augusta missed out on battle honors and he uh, fell on his sword, even though it was probably the right decision that he'd made. Um, I'm, just, uh, I'm just introducing this, uh, tombstone here, which is not from Exeter, but from Caerleon. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any inscribed uh, tombstones, stone tombstones from Exeter. Um, the chances are that all burials during the period uh, of the occupation at Exeter, uh, which was 55 to around 75 AD, were cremations uh, without, uh, without um, uh, coffins and without tombstones. In AD 75, uh, the Legion uh, left Exeter and was moved to Caerleon in Wales uh, because the Welsh tribes there were causing trouble. And so we can assume that as far as the Southwest was concerned, there wasn't quite such uh, a sense uh, that there was going to be any threat, although the forts, we saw one of the earlier slides, uh, the, the forts outside Exeter, the forts were retained for another 10 years. So there was an army presence uh, beyond 75 for about another 10 years. But the reason I'm I, I want you to look at this particular stone is because this is the stone of a veteran of the Second Legion Augusta, uh, vet here, Legion Second Augusta, and he lived, and he lived for one C, 100 years. So it is quite possible that this uh, veteran served at Exeter uh, when he was moved, when he moved with the Legion to Caerleon and he died there, he, uh, he may well have been one of, one of those who occupied the, the Exeter Fortress. So the Romans uh, leave Isca, Dumnonio, uh, Isca rather, the Fortress of Isca as it would have been known. Um, but what happens to the bathhouse? Um, it's the only stone building in the, uh, in, in the fortress. It, it's too valuable as a building to uh, be uh, demolished. Um, and at the same time, it's decided that uh, the city of Exodus will become a city and administrative center for the whole of the Southwest. So it acquires the title Isca Dumnoniorum, the Dumnoni having been the Iron Age tribe of the region. Um, so we are now starting to see the area becoming fully Romanized and uh, the birthplace of the city of Exeter is around AD 80, perhaps five years after the Legion has left. And the bathhouse, uh, the ruins there are shown, uh, the excavated ruins are shown in red. Um, it was no longer needed, of course, for the 6,000 uh, troops, the 6,000 auxiliaries, it, was, it no longer had a military use, um, so the hypercourse was infilled, but as I say, the building was too valuable to be demolished, and so it was converted as one would. 
um, and it was converted into a basilica. Uh, that is the standard administrative uh, building for a Roman city, the equivalent of our city center. And the uh, walls that you can see shown in yellow are those which were excavated, which were belonged to the conversion of around AD 80 into the Basilica. And you can see that on the right hand side, that's actually the main entrance here up these steps. Floor level, of course, is, is, is up here. This is the main entrance into the, into the converted bathhouse, now the Basilica. And there you can see on the photograph in the top, uh, top left there, if I can get the cursor to work onto the steps. Here we are. This is the ground level. And you're seeing the below ground uh, excavated areas there below ground of, of the former bathhouse uh, system. But here are the steps into the basilica. And there again. And I wasn't here on a I wasn't, uh, sorry, I wasn't there in 1971, but I gather this was the very first trench of the excavation of the excavations in 1971, came straight down onto these steps. Uh, quite some serendipity there. Those steps which had been hidden for the best part of, uh, of 2000 years, um, revealed in 1971. And in the plan there, and again, I'm taking my cursor to the steps. Here's the Basilica, the Forum, exactly the same plan as you have in Rome itself, uh, but on a smaller scale, of course, and a marketplace um, in, in front of there. But signifying that Exeter, uh, by this date, Exeter is, is a Roman city. It's a Roman city on the very edge of the Western Roman Empire. And a city demands that it has walls, as would Rome, as would any self-respecting Roman city. So uh, walls were constructed around AD 200. So about 100, and, uh, get, get, get getting on for 150 years after the uh, fortress, uh, the uh, city has become established to the extent that it starts to acquire all of those elements of civic pride. This wall is not built for defense. This wall is built to demonstrate uh, that this is a city of importance. So it, it, therefore it has walls, it will have had a temple, uh, a theater and uh, the other uh, accoutrements, for want of a better word, of a Roman city. Uh, there you can see uh, a plan on the left there of, uh, uh, of the Roman city. And as I say, there's, there's the walled area, which you can still walk around to this day. And at its heart, at its very heart, where the bathhouse was, and in front of the cathedral was the basilica the civic centre, the centre of Roman administration, not just for Exeter, but the entire southwest. Uh, on the right there, you're simply seeing one of the roads of the, uh, of the city. Uh, it acquired townhouses there. You're seeing a reconstruction of a, a Roman townhouses. Several of these existed uh, close by. The best place to live was as close as possible to the basilica. And we found evidence of some of these Roman townhouses um, would be the home to important officials, no doubt, uh, with, uh, with mosaic floors, with, with their own uh, heating systems, with their own hypercourses. There you can see survival of a corridor, tessellated corridor at uh, St. Catherine's Almshouses. So uh, uh, again, not very far from the from the basilica, just behind it, a reconstruction now of the of the city, 
as it would have appeared late in the in the Roman period. And I mentioned Rougemont and its quarries. There they are now incorporated into the Roman town. And here's our Roman bathhouse. Now the basilica right at the center of things here. And uh, still with the main gate coming out here to uh, uh, to the crossing of the X, which would have had a a, a wooden, certainly a wooden uh, bridge, if not a stone one, um, across the river. And believe it or not, it's not impossible that the uh, Basilica, the Curia, the main council chamber of the um, um, of the Basilica may not in Exeter in Exeter may not have looked too dissimilar uh, um, to this. It's quite conceivable. And really to wrap up, I see I'm coming up to five o'clock. Um, that bathhouse and Basilica Forum. Uh, still exists, of course, in 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 its uh, in its ruined state beneath the uh, grass in front of the cathedral um, by the War Memorial. Um, in 1974, when excavations uh, finished, uh, there was the intention to have uh, the ruins on public display. Unfortunately, that year coincided with an oil crisis and a three-day week. Uh, so it was uh, it was reburied with sand uh, in sand with the promise that in better times um, it would go on public display. Um, but those better times have, have come and gone and come and gone and come and gone. And uh, and uh, every so often you will see that same picture on the front of the echo. In this case, it's uh, a 2013. Uh, example, we could finally be digging up our Roman bars again. Well, it uh, didn't happen. Um, but at the same time, I think this was 2013 as well, it might be 2004 on a, on a previous uh, occasion when there was talk of the Roman bars. Um, at least some of the legions came back. Um, here, here we see uh, some members of the Second, Aug uh, Second Legion Augusta reenactment group. Um, appearing there standing in front of the cathedral on the site of the Roman bathhouse. I believe that's my last slide. Um, that looks like five o'clock as well to me. So I'll hand back to Mark. Thank you, John. It is bang on five o'clock. Congratulations. You, uh, <laughs> you did the precise hour there. Uh, that's excellent. Uh, while I'm talking, I'm just going to um, turn back on the opportunity for people to unmute themselves or to turn their video on if they want to. So if people want to join the room now, they can. Um, yes, uh, it's always fascinating to see pictorial representations like this of, of what is under our feet as we walk around um, and to me it is a great shame that um, these excavations haven't been redone um, do you think they should be after all this time yeah, yeah yes i do and i think they will be uh, uh, not clearly i suspect in my lifetime um, it will happen at some stage um, they i, I I've said this was the, well, we, we believe this to be the second, the second stone building in Britain. And we have the remains of it. We have the, 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 the remains of this building in Exeter uh, below ground. And so the only other one is the, uh, at this stage was the Temple of Claudius. Um, you can still uh, visit in Colchester, you can visit the uh, remains of part of that below ground, uh, the Temple of Claudius, but there is, there is the opportunity here, if it's done correctly, uh, to put on this, an underground display, which would not, 
would not clash. It, it would be all purely underground so that there would be no clash with the front of the uh, cathedral, uh, which of course is uh, significant in its own right as an ar architectural uh, masterpiece. And indeed, one of the reasons uh, for the excavation, as I mentioned, was uh, the removal of the Victorian St. Mary Major Church, which was built cheek by jowl in front of, <laughs> front of the cathedral, and the removal of uh, cars which were being parked uh, on a constant basis right up to the, the front of the cathedral. So it would have to be done correctly, and it would be expensive. Um, but it would it would make the kind of return over time that would make it uh, viable. Hmm. You you didn't mention fines particularly in hmm. in this talk. Were there any significant fines aside from the architecture itself? Yes, you're right. I I haven't I I didn't mention fines very much. Um, the uh, in the, the bathhouse itself, uh, there wasn't a great deal. No, I can't think, I think there was a, there was one, there was one sculptured head, but actually that came, a small sculptured head. But thinking about that, that came from the Guildhall site, not the bathhouse site. <clears throat> it's mostly the, the finds, the significant finds were mostly architectural fragments. Mm. In, in other words, um, the glass, the um, and 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 the uh, the Perbeck marble uh, fittings, for example, yeah. Um, let me just throw the opportunity out for anybody else who might have questions to either pop them in the chat window or indicate if you've turned your video on that you do have a question. Uh, David, <coughs> oh, is that me? Yeah, that is you. Okay. I didn't see my little yellow hand because I've moved I, the box. I can see it. Um, <laughs> okay. I was just going to check on something with, that John said. Am I correct in my recollection that um, it was suggested that once the processional way was built to, to the cathedral, part of it was over the bathhouse? And that was another disincentive for the authorities to say, well, let's expose the bathhouse. Am I remembering correctly or not? No, 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 you're right. You are right. It, it, it has, it, it, it has caused, a, it, ha, it does cause a problem, not insurmountable, but, yeah. but it is a problem um, yeah. because um, I'm, I'm not quite sure well, it's history now, but why why that decision was 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 made with, with regard to to the steps? But the but 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 the thing the thing that um, perhaps put a spanner in the works certainly in two thousand and four was that historic England uh, then English heritage made the decision to. Um, designate those steps as a listed structure oh, yeah. um, so 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 it, it, it is a hurdle um, I say it's it's not it and it's not insurmountable and uh, in the, the the more recent and um, there have been several attempts now but perhaps the most recent one uh, to revive the whole scheme actually came from the cathedral itself um, but unfortunately, uh, and the dean of, of, of the time, um, whose name now escapes me, but he, he'd come from York, uh, down from York, and he'd, he'd seen what, what had been done there, in, in, and, and indeed was instrumental himself in, you know, as, as you know, York is a very successful, uh, not, not only Viking, but Roman uh, tourism. Um, and uh, he, he, he saw the potential, but uh, unfortunately it, it didn't, it just right. didn't materialize. And then he's moved, he's moved on now. Right, okay. Can I, can I just say as well that, um, first of all, I apologize. I missed the first few minutes of your talk. I, I find it absolutely fascinating altogether the talk, it was great. And I think we owe a special vote of thanks to John because 
John was uh, originally um, uh, agreed to, to give this talk in person in Crediton at the Boniface Centre um, when the History Society were arranging their programme of talks for, well, I suppose it was it last year or the year before, I don't know. This pandemic has uh, caused such confusion in my mind. Mm. Um, but he agreed to do it then. And um, fortunately for us, agreed to do the talk this time by Zoom. Um, and I, I think um, we are especially grateful to you, John, for agreeing to do that because these are difficult times and we're all scratching our heads about how we should proceed and to what extent we can just take up, carry on where we left off and that sort of thing. And um, it was an excellent talk and uh, we're very grateful to you for agreeing to do it. So thank you. Thanks. Brilliant. Thank you, David. Uh, yes, absolutely. And, and delivering them in this way does have its benefits. There, there is somebody who has uh, mentioned in the chat just a, a few moments ago that they volunteer at York Roman Baths. So um, obviously we, you know, we are able to welcome people from, from right outside of the area to these talks, um, even if there are connections such as that, which, which is excellent. So yeah. um, thank you for that. Anybody else got anything they would like to ask John? while you're just considering if there is. Um, I was just going to also ask what else there might be that um, hasn't been excavated that we might consider to be of significance in the area? Well, uh, <laughs> that is a question. Um, I think all the way from um, Exeter to Topsham, either side of Topsham Road, uh, there is the potential and the possibility of finding Roman military establishments. Um, in, when I arrived in, uh, in Exeter in 1972, um, the, only Roman is, the only Roman military site was the fortress itself, which we, we knew from the remains of the bathhouse and the barrack building. Subsequent to that, and certainly within, I would say within the last, um, within the last 10 years really, especially with the building that has taken place in the so-called Topsham Gap, uh, we've seen a number of Roman military sites uh, uh, have come to light, um, including the St. Louis site, the, the so-called Vika civilian town. Um, and a number of, of military sites are at the top of the end. I think there's going to be more. I think that there's a potential for more anyway uh, in areas that haven't yet been developed. Um, as for the within the fortress itself, I, I think I mentioned the, the one building we would have expected which is missing is the hospital. And I'm pretty sure, unless there are any plans to demolish the cathedral, um, we're, we're, we're not going to get to that one. Thank you. Uh, there is a, a question from uh, Jean and or Roger. Uh, you'll need to unmute yourself, Roger. Yeah, thanks. It was uh, it, 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 it was me. Great talk. Thank you very much indeed. I was interested in the relationship between the legionaries and the auxiliaries and was initially a bit surprised to see the legionaries doing quite a lot of manual work in the things that you depicted. I guess they needed to have something to keep them busy as well as uh, as well as bathing. I wonder, John, whether you can comment further on on that relationship between the mm. two sectors. Yeah, I, I I think I can, and um, you 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 may be surprised also to hear that the forts largely would have been constructed by legionaries. Yeah. So. Um, so these type of semi-permanent forts that were outstationed for auxiliaries, it's the legionaries that would have, got, would have gone out and constructed them, and then the auxiliaries moved in. Um, the legionaries were the par excellence, uh, as, as well as uh, fighting troops, of course. Um, they were the elite in the sense of undertaking 
uh, infrastructure and construction works, such as bridges and roads. Um, the auxiliaries were more of a, 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 an outstationed fighting force. So yeah. for, for, for example, just, just say um, that there had been some kind of insurrection in the uh, west of uh, say Cornwall or, or in West Devon and, and uh, Iron Age groups were advancing on Exeter. It is the auxiliaries who would have encountered who, who would have been sent out to encounter them, not the legionaries. Um, but the legionaries were there as an elite fighting force if things went wrong. Yeah. But the, the auxiliaries were, were meant to be the peacekeepers. Right. So could, could you, what was the sort of ethnic origin? Uh, um, uh, I guess yeah. it was very varied for both of the groups. Yeah, yeah, it was. It, it, it's quite incredible, um, and particularly auxiliaries. Uh, now, the one, the one thing to remember about auxiliaries is that they were, where the, wherever they were recruited from, they were always sent away from that area. <laughs> um, yes. yes, I yes. see you're smiling and you know the reason why. Yes. Um, and that is because if they, they were then trained by the Roman army, they were trained by Roman officers. If they then decided that they wanted to rebel um, and they were close to home, they could use everything they'd learned against the Romans. Yeah. So you find you you find auxiliaries being posted huge distances away from uh, where they were re recruited. Mm -hmm. Of course, the rewards the rewards were quite significant. Um, if you survived, if you served twenty five years, you were given a grant of land. You were given a grant of money, and and significantly, you were given Roman citizenship which was a, 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 of, of high value. Yeah, 25 years though. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah. I, I, as you can imagine, um, I, I've, never, I've never been in the forces. Um, I suspect, I sus you, can almost, you can almost know, don't you, that legionary soldiers would have looked down their nose at yeah. auxiliaries. They really would, wouldn't they? <laughs> <laughs> there, there would have been no love lost there. And I think I mentioned um, that auxiliaries may well have been allowed to use the bathhouse. Yes. Reluctantly, I suspect. You, I, you, Once you a think month they, instead of twice yeah, exactly, a week. Exactly, yes, exactly, yeah. It would have been a privilege for them to, and, uh, and uh, you, you, who knows, there might have been some fights. <laughs> <laughs> as as there is, you know, I work in Plymouth. And I know, I know this. There, uh, there's this in the past anyway. There have been fights between um, Marines and 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 mm. branches of the Navy and the Army. You know, they. Uh, <laughs> it's just one of those things. Thank you very much. Lovely. Thank you, Roger. Um, a, a couple from Isabel in the chat here, who uh, Isabel said, thank you. It's the most complete talk and covered so much. Um, I understand there's no sign of an amphitheater in Exeter. Uh, and Isabel also wonders if there's any evidence of the necessary water supply for the baths. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll try the second one first, and that's the water supply. <clears throat> um, the water supply definitely came from St. Sidwell's outside the fortress. Um, and as you know, I mean, the very name St. Sidwell's, um, you, 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 have a, you have prolific springs there um, that have been known about since the Roman times. You've got, is it the, uh, oh, is it the Long Brook? The Long Brook, which, which runs around the contours and reaches the River X. The Romans took water from the area of Sidwell, uh, St. Sidwell's, and they brought it into the bathhouse almost certainly uh, by means of an aqueduct. Now, I don't know whether that aqueduct would have been stone or wooden. We, we found some uh, evidence of the base, which we think may have been the aqueduct um, in the high street. It, 
in we said we know for definite that they brought water in from there by means of a wooden aqueduct after the fortresses have left in AD 100 uh, uh, um, because we found a wooden launder bringing the water across the fortress ditches which had been left behind at the Harlequins, when, when the Harlequin uh, Centre was developed, the excavation there, and the wooden piles were tested by dendro uh, chronology, and they were found, the wooden piles were found to have been cut around AD 100. And, and that was bringing water in for the civilian baths, not the legionary baths. The legionary baths, so an aqueduct, uh, bringing the water in to the bathhouse, then the outflow went, and we know this, the outflow went down through what is now Lower Coombe Street. And excavations at the other side of the Western Way, where there's a car park now, discovered two massive channels, which were the outflow of the bathhouse water. Uh, 70,000 gallons a day, I think, uh, went through. Um, and out through the outflow channels into the River X. Oh, the amphitheater. Um, yeah, tricky. Um, I've said that Exeter has everything, or uh, would have acquired everything that the Roman city should have. So it should have an amphitheater. Um, don't know where it is. Uh, it might turn up. Uh, well, I don't know whether it might turn up around the where the Iron Bridge is, um, bottom of North Street, but that's just a guess, and I'm floundering on that one. That's why I came to it last. <laughs> okay, so I mean, it's safe to say that there is no sign of one at this stage, then, no. but but one may well turn up. Thank you, uh, Isabel. I hope that answers your two points. Uh, David has a second question. Uh, you muted yourself, David, so you need to unmute yourself. Sorry to come back again, but um, I should know the answer to this, but I'm ashamed to admit I don't. Uh, I was a bit surprised at the size of the garrison, 6,000, I think you said, didn't you? And yeah. I'm, I'm just wondering, what do we know about the actual civilian population in that area, in the city and so on, um, at that time? Sorry, uh, um, alarm bells for ringing. So, sorry, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm just <laughs> no, you. No, okay. uh, no, I was just asking, uh, yeah. what do we yes, know yes. about the civilian population at that yeah. time? Yeah, we we don't know a lot. Well, we certainly don't know numbers. Uh, we can be pretty certain of, of uh, numbers with regard to the military units. Um, no, we don't know. Um, what we do know is that there, there were civilians inhabiting an area um, outside of the south gate of the fortress in, um, in an area which is now, uh, well, what's there? Western Way, top of Holloway Street. Uh, there was a civilian area uh, and then there was <coughs> a major civilian area um, at uh, the former St. Louis College on Topsham Road. It seems likely that there were further civilian areas um, in Topsham. Um, but of course, they, they're, they're using the same pottery as, um, as the uh, Roman uh, soldiers. Um, there is growing evidence now to suggest that the entire population, but we don't know what it is, at the St. Louis College uh, was civilian. Okay, thank you. No numbers, I'm afraid. Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, that looks like it wraps up the questions that have uh, been indicated. I can't see any other ones outstanding. Um, so could I ask everybody, please, to just show your appreciation in the chat or on your screen or wherever else you would like to um, for that talk from John. John, thank you so much.
Um, um, th thank you. And there is, of course, there is one thing that I've forgotten, which is so pertinent. There should, there really, really should be a Roman fort at Crediton. There should be. Um, but nothing has been uh, come to light. I, I expect most people will know there is a Roman villa at, uh, at Fordton, um, uh, down near the railway station um, that was discovered by aerial photography. There should be a, uh, because of the Roman road system, there should be a Roman fort at Crediton. There must be, it demands it, but it's not been found. There's still, there's still time. We also want to find the original cathedral as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got plenty of time. We we will see what happens. Uh, John, yeah. thank you. That was fascinating. Thanks from everybody here.